Ah, merci beaucoup à Vincent pour uh, cet accueil uh, très chaleureux. Uh, merci aussi à Joanne et à, Stéph à Stéphane de m'avoir invité à présenter dans le cadre des matinées con constitutionnelles. C'est vraiment un grand honneur uh, de me retrouver ici. Uh, et c'est aussi toujours un honneur uh, et un plaisir de revenir à l'Université de Montréal. Um, comme vous l'avez dit, mon grand-père est un ancien, mais aussi mon père est un ancien. Oui, alors uh, je me sens tout à fait à l'aise ici. Uh, finalement, je suis très reconnaissante d'avoir parmi nous mon premier professeur de droit constitutionnel, uh, celui qui m'a introduit au sujet fascinant du partage des compétences, uh, dont je parlerai aujourd'hui, uh, Armand de Métral et aussi de mes deux étudiants. Uh, je présenterai en franglais. Uh, Joanne m'a assuré que c'est valide. <rire> Et euh, comme langue. Et euh, euh, je m'excuse à l'avance. Euh, je reviendrai pour les points les plus importants et les plus complexes à l'anglais. C'est toujours comme ça. Euh, 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 et malheureusement, je suis la reine des anglicismes. Et euh, euh, je ne peux rien faire <rire> à ce moment. Euh, alors, euh, euh, ouais, c'est tout. Euh, euh, voilà. OK. Euh, euh, une introduction. Je vais commencer avec une petite introduction à ce projet et ce qui m'a apporté à, à étudier euh, à ce projet. Le, le titre de mon projet, c'est euh, « Vers un esprit, un esprit sain en partage des compétences. Uh, 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 um, uh, jurisdiction, criminal law and uh, uh, health law jurisdictions in Canada. » Et uh, uh, c'est un titre bilingue. Um, et mes recherches se trouvent uh, dans l'intersection, uh, 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 comme vous l'a décrit Vincent, uh, du droit pénal et uh, uh, la santé. Et j'étudie principalement comment les cadres médicaux uh, et de santé sont en concurrence avec les cadres du uh, droit pénal pour le traitement des enjeux particuliers et difficiles. Uh, typiquement, des questions qui sont uh, le sujet de désaccords moraux, um, qui ont des conséquences importantes pour la santé physique ou uh, mentale. Quelques exemples familiers au Canada sont évidemment le travail de sexe, la prostitution, euh, l'usage des euh, stupéfiants, euh, l'aide médicale à mourir, par exemple. Et je travaille aussi en criminalisation de l'omission de révéler son euh, VIH à son partenaire euh, sexuel. Euh, un autre su sujet où les approches de santé publique sont général, généralement contraires aux approches du droit criminel. Euh, dans chacun de ces domaines, le droit, la politique et le discours populaire depuis des décennies Uh, traite ces questions comme questions criminelles, uh, des questions de santé ou bien les deux. Uh, et je suis intéressée par les questions de comment le droit constitutionnel reflète uh, uh, et dirige le rôle de la loi dans la réflexion et la façon dont ces questions sont abordées à la fois dans la pratique et dans le uh, discours public. Uh, les questions des compétences constitutionnelles n'ont pas figuré significativement uh, dans mes travaux jusqu'à assez récemment. Mon focus, c'était uh, par contre sur le, uh, 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 les développements dans l'article 7, comme peut-être vous attendiez, um, uh, de la Charte canadienne uh, et son capacité de pouvoir uh, pousser ces questions uh, dans le cadre médico-scientifique uh, plutôt que le cadre criminel. Dans cette présentation, par contre, j'explore les développements uh, 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 un peu sous-examinés uh, dans le partage des compétences qui, je dirais, commence à avoir une conception uh, uh, normative de ce qui s'agit d'une affaire criminelle plutôt qu'une affaire de santé um, et les méthodes appropriées de traiter telles affaires dans le contexte du fédéralisme canadien. Uh, je vais commencer avec un petit mot sur mes travaux antérieurs qui m'ont apporté à ce projet. Uh, dans un court travail uh, qui se retrouve uh, dans un volume récent édité par nos, uh, vos collègues, uh, nos collègues, uh, Catherine Régis, Lara Coury et Robert Coury, uh, je décris comment l'importance grandissante de l'analyse de la proportionnalité dans l'interprétation de la droit à la vie, la liberté et la sécurité de la personne dans l'article 7 uh, de la charte permettent de réor réorienter des questions considérées uh, dans le pénal vers la santé. Uh, et je simplifie ici uh, un peu, uh, parce que ce n'est pas le sujet de mon travail uh, uh, que je présente ici. Uh, essentiellement, dans Bedford, uh, PHS et Carter, uh, uh, des cas assez récents, la Cour suprême a exigé les, que les gouvernements justifient leurs actions qui portent atteinte à la vie, la santé ou la sécurité en termes de raisonnabilité par rapport au but de la loi. Uh, C'est quelque chose que la plupart d'entre vous connaissez, je crois, assez bien. Um, en trouvant uh, les justifications insuffisantes dans ces trois cas, la Cour a effectivement retrécit la portée uh, de la loi uh, pénale ou, autrement compris, le pouvoir du gouvernement fédéral de criminaliser, uh, pratiquement. Um, 
euh, on connaît euh, le cas assez bien, j'imagine, ici, mais l'essentiel, c'est que l'omission d'accorder, par exemple, de la fédérale, d'accorder une exemption euh, sur la loi réglementant certaines drogues et autres substances au centre d'injection surveillé, euh, dans le cas de PHS, euh, PHS n'était pas relié de façon appropriée au but de la loi de protéger euh, 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 la santé et la sécurité publique. Euh, dans Carter, les lois criminelles contre l'aide médicale à mourir ont été jugées insuffisamment liées à l'objet de la loi d'empêcher que les personnes vulnérables soient incitées à se suicider dans un moment de faiblesse. Néanmoins, néanmoins, on a observé que euh, des limites euh, dans le travail que j'ai fait euh, de cette stratégie pour canaliser les questions dans un cadre de santé plutôt qu'un criminel, et il y a plusieurs, je ne les décrirai pas ici, euh, mais le plus évident, c'est que c'est le gouvernement. Euh, si le gouvernement veut remettre l'affaire dans la compétence pénale, il n'a qu'à changer la manière dont il formule ses objectifs. Euh, en fait, c'est exactement ce qu'on a vu dans les réactions du gouvernement Harper, qui a adopté le projet de loi C-36 euh, après Bedford et euh, 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 le projet de loi C-2 après PHS, essentiellement réaffirmer le cadre pénal. Um, now, I could go on about further uh, theoretical limitations and potentials of rights frameworks in shaping the behavior, in shaping, excuse me, the relationship between health and criminal law. Uh, but the purpose of this presentation is to examine uh, what I consider to be an aspect of constitutionalism that reflects more subtly, but I think in more enduring ways, both practically and theoretically, um, what it means to change normative ideas about the nature of the health and the criminal law lenses through constitutionalism. Uh, and this uh, draws on research that I did for a forthcoming book chapter on health law and policy in Canada. Uh, it's a textbook chapter, and so the paper itself is largely descriptive. Um, in it, I explain the collision course between health and criminal law lenses in society and in law. Um, and I'll talk about those a little bit. Uh, uh, um, part of the collision course relates to changing social conceptions of health, medicine, and crime. So not legal conceptions, but social conceptions. Um, sociologists, in particular social constructionists, have long described how social problems or issues are increasingly uh, constructed through two different lenses. Um, and those two lenses bring the same matters into collision with one another in terms of the conceptual framework uh, that society um, legislatures, the general public, might engage. Uh, and what I try to say is that this sort of social collision between the, law fra between the uh, criminal frame and the health frame is paralleled by a legal collision between the criminal frame and the health frame. So I'll explain what I mean. Um, first, the first phenomenon, which is familiar certainly to my students in the room, um, as, uh, is uh, growing criminalization, uh, long observed by sociologists. Um, and that refers to the growing tendency to view problems as worthy of criminal sanction. So people like Bill Stuntz and David Garland have observed the proliferation through the middle and end of the 20th century of criminal offenses, driven, they say, by increasing uh, societal intolerance to risk and an increasing uh, perception of risk as somehow something that individuals are responsible for. So uh, things that might have once been considered sort of bad luck or accidents of society um, or arguably the result of systemic factors in society are treated as individual uh, problems of moral blameworthiness. Um, a parallel phenomenon is the growth of um, uh, health and medical discourse um, in society. Um, so in terms of health, you might consider something like, you know, the, the concept of health has always been broad. So uh, consider some, well not always, but long been broad. So if you, if you consider uh, the World Health Organization's 1948 definition of health as a state of, and this is, their, this is the, the, the way the World, health de the World Health Organization defines health, as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being. Um, obviously, that's an extremely broad mandate for the World Health Organization. Um, uh, um, and indeed, the expansiveness of that definition has been criticized for its potential uh, to follow, uh, to swallow up every aspect of human uh, existence. Uh, but yet, in a way, despite that already very broad definition of health, um, concepts of health have only actually grown in recent years. 
in particular with the ascendance of interest in what are called social determinants of health. Um, uh, or the idea that health is often uh, determined far more by, by a broad range of social and economic factors than by curative care. And in fact, health outcomes are better predicted by uh, uh, individual wealth than they are uh, often by the availability even of curative um, uh, 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 interventions. So one of our mutual colleagues joked with me about uh, a set of music educators who were facing cuts to music education in schools. And they said, well, isn't there some way that we could frame this as a health issue? And then we could finally get you know, priority for this uh, uh, within the education system. Um, uh, even for those who don't ascribe to the broadest of social determinants frames, however, there's been another sociological phenomenon uh, which has broadened the kinds of things that can be considered health matters. Um, and this is called uh, criminal medicalization or patholi pathologization, um, something that was of great interest, of course, to uh, someone like uh, Michel Foucault. Um, and here, people say, for example, that something like human sadness, or you know, we've, many of us have been distraught at the political circumstances and events that have surrounded us um, in our times. Um, and uh, 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 now, one might imagine that those kinds of things are reconceived not as you know, despair, legitimate despair, but as medical, a medical condition called depression. Um, uh, and similarly, even around something like drug addiction, we've seen increasingly people like uh, Carl Hart at Columbia suggesting that the vast majority of drug use, for example, um, isn't pathological, leading him to declare that really it's drug not, you know, drugs aren't the problem, it's society that's the problem. Um, uh, uh, um, so that's, that's an interesting set of research. But the point of all this um, is that, uh, uh, you know, we've got these two sort of ever-broadening and ever-competing frames that exist within our society of viewing things as either health matters or criminal matters, um, and increasingly less space, in a way, for viewing them as neither one of those things, um, which uh, uh, is an arguable approach that you might want to take. Um, uh, uh, Nonetheless, these two frames are in a collision course in our society. And uh, one of the things that I do in the chapter is explain how, in fact, um, that collision course is just as evident in um, uh, 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 jurisdictional analysis. Uh, so those who know uh, the varying degrees of knowledge in the room about the constitutional division of powers, uh, but uh, you'll all know, I think, that there is no single head of jurisdiction um, called health. Um, in fact, if anything, health has been described as an amorphous topic, both in jurisprudence and in scholarship. Um, and in fact, health matters are addressed under a range of heads of jurisdiction under uh, the Constitution, under the, the sections 91 and 92 of the Constitution Act 1867. This is as much a consequence of history as it is of the unwieldiness of health as a concept. Um, in fact, at the time of Confederation, and I think maybe it's more a consequence of history, at the time of Confederation, health was con considered much more a private than a state interest. It was understood primarily in curative terms um, uh, as the absence of illness, and it fell on private parties and religious institutions to help out when somebody did become ill. Um, but ever-broadening conceptions of health, which I've just described, um, and also the growing involvement of the state in all aspects of the lives of Canadians under a broad range of heads of jurisdiction has meant that overlapping provincial and federal jurisdiction has been the norm. Um, so provinces have generally been held to have primary power over health matters, in part through their jurisdiction over hospitals um, in section 92.7, but much more by implication through their powers uh, there are more plenary powers over property and civil rights in the province and matters of a merely local and private nature. Um, this is well known. Um, in addition, the power over municipal institutions that govern uh, public health matters mean that the provinces have this sort of broad plenary jurisdiction, which has been described in the jurisprudence as this broad um, primary and plenary jurisdiction over health. Um, in addition, I mentioned uh, the involvement, the greater involvement of the state in the lives of uh, most Canadians, well, that comes up also um, through various different kinds of um, heads of power that might not necessarily be evidently connected to health. One that's obviously connected to health uh, now is the federal power over patents. 
right? And the federal power over patents, of course, has had a substantial impact on cost of medications, um, uh, something that, uh, in fact, provincial governments have had to bear the brunt of, given that it's their uh, 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 provincial insurance plans that end up having to pay for uh, those very expensive medications. Um, so this illustrates how along this sort of broad and expanding primary provincial health jurisdiction is also this an expanding federal jurisdiction. So of course there's the spending power, um, which grounds federal involvement in Medicare, which I'm not going to talk about much today, um, because my focus is really on the criminal law power. Um, and of course there's federal jurisdiction over Aboriginal health. Um, so I won't talk about those developments of those powers, but I will talk about some of the implications of my analysis for those powers um, later on in my presentation. Instead, my interest is in the federal criminal law jurisdiction in relation to health. Um, and generally, again, those in the room who are experts will uh, not need to be told that the federal criminal law power has been interpreted so broadly that it effectively grants the government very broad jurisdiction over health matters. I don't know if the first year students in the room have yet got to the margarine reference, um, uh, but uh, in that case, the Supreme Court defined the criminal law power very broadly to prohibit and punish behaviors with an, quote, evil or injurious effect upon the public, um, citing the protection of health in addition to morals and ethics as the ordinary purposes of the criminal law. Um, since then, for the most part, so, so the, the role of the criminal law in protecting health was established very early on in the margarine reference, and indeed in that case, it was uh, the um, uh, federal uh, prohibition against margarine that was found to be directed more at a commercial interest, if you recall, um, rather than a, uh, a, a true criminal law interest of protecting health, since margarine, at least at the time, wasn't understood as being bad for you. Um, so... Uh, um, I remember very vividly my first introduction to the margarine reference in first year criminal in first year constitutional law. Um, it was nice to come back to it. Um, uh, uh, now, since then, courts have tended to support even bro broader and broader um, jurisdiction uh, for uh, scope for criminal legislation in relation to health alongside this plenary provincial power. So, for example, there's been federal regulation of tobacco, firearms, food processing, environment, assisted reproduction, abortion all have been upheld as valid exercises of the criminal law. Um, as long as you had, uh, the courts determined, a, a prohibition, a penalty, and a criminal law purpose, the criminal law was constitutionally valid. And all of those were, for a long time, very broadly construed. Um, first of all, famously, the concept of prohibition uh, has included prohibitions with regimes of exceptions that are so complex that it effectively amounts to regulation. Um, in uh, 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 the Swain case, the Supreme Court held that Parliament may legislate to prevent crime as well as punish it, um, thereby justifying a regime for the indefinite detention of criminally accused persons who are found not criminally responsible by reason of insanity under Section 16 of the Criminal Code. Um, in other words, uh, uh, the treatment of people found not criminally responsible, although it's uh, perhaps popularly conceived as a medical treatment and is governed by the very same norms, uh, was considered to be acceptably within uh, federal jurisdiction, even though this kind of detention is not actually a penalty, right? Strictly speaking, it wouldn't be a penalty. And until recently, criminal law goals meant anything directed very broadly at public peace, order, morality, health, security. Um, and uh, we've seen the consequences of this collision perhaps most clearly in the context of drug use, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about drug regulation going forward. Um, I don't need to tell uh, this group about how the courts have generally tended to respond to this collision course. Up until recently, they've more or less held their hands up and said, thrown their hands up and said, listen, work it out for yourselves. We don't want to be involved in this, and left it to uh, political factors to try to resolve um, how to coordinate these obviously overlapping, often conflicting um, jurisdictional powers. And uh, there has been a judicial contribution to this through the approval of what uh, judges have called cooperative federalism, um, preferring it, as the court says, um, uh, preferring, as the court says, um, interlocking federal and provincial schemes over uh, strict separations. 
Of course, these informal methods of accommodation have meant different things over time. And so commenters with different perspectives on the matter of this uh, political organization have used different language to describe it, sometimes uh, betraying their views of how it's been working out. So cooperative federalism for actors, uh, uh, when actors have been perceived to have a fair and equal voice. Executive federalism by those who point to the lack of accountability that can be inherent in these kinds of political arrangements. Um, and other names like accommodative federalism or Harper's most recent open federalism. Um, uh, uh, all of these different models have been supported by the court um, through uh, um, uh, things like broadly conceived jurisdictions over both health and criminal law, facilitating the overlap, of course, um, but also through generous applications of rules like the double aspect rule. And in a way, you can see the temptation to do that because the crime frame is legitimate, arguably, and the health frame is legitimate, arguably, and uh, uh, courts have not taken up invitations to try to uh, 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 pronounce on wh whether something, a phenomenon like drug addiction, for example, um, uh, ought to be viewed through one or the other. Um, uh, and so what unites these approaches is that they're all political arrangements in the context of overlapping um, and complex uh, jurisdiction. Um, the history of federal and provincial wrangling over health care, which I promised I wasn't going to talk about much, but I'll just mention briefly, seems to have worked well enough as long as those jurisdictions were relatively united in their mission. Um, so commenters have observed that up until around the 1980s, people were, the, both, both jurisdictions were still relatively interested in um, uh, 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 building up uh, generally the welfare state, and it worked reasonably well. Uh, but st students of, uh, of, of healthcare, of Medicare in Canada, know that trust diminished tremendously through cuts to uh, healthcare transfer payments in the 1990s. Um, and more recently, there have been a great deal of ideological differences um, among the players. So, for example, you know, not long ago, uh, Gaetan, ba Gaetan Barrett uh, got mad at Jane Philpott um, for threatening to withhold transfer payments for user fees that Quebec is charging in relation to healthcare. I think we've all experienced invitations to pay these kinds of user fees. Well, they're clearly unlawful under the Canada Health Act, uh, and uh, Gaetan Barrett took great offense to Jane Philpott's um, uh, 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 claims that she was gonna enforce the Canada Health Act. That's, um, that's uh, 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 clear. Um, further, in the context of criminal law specifically, this so-called cooperative federalism has really meant federal supremacy. And I think that that's clear. Um, so the doctrine of federal paramountcy applies differently in different contexts. But in the criminal law context, um, well, it, generally, it deems provincial laws inoperative to the extent that they're incompatible with federal laws. Um, and there's uh, considered to be no such incompatibility unless it's impossible or would overly frustrate the federal law to comply simultaneously with both. The result in practice is that either way, the more restrictive regime prevails. And in a contest between a health approach and a criminal law approach, it's possible for the health approach to be more restrictive, but it's not typical, right? Normally, the criminal law will be the more restrictive. So for example, a provincial policy to provide physician-prescribed heroin, um, which we've seen a lot in the news recently, um, would be unable to operate as long as federal prohibitions on the drug remain in place, same issue that really came up in, in the PHS case. Um, and Quebec's act respecting end-of-life care, uh, which permits physician aid in dying, uh, would either have been rendered inoperative by the criminal code prohibitions that uh, were in place when the law was first introduced, or perhaps uh, rendered meaningless as physicians would need to work within the constraints of the federal law, um, or at the very least hampered by a chilling effect that comes from the uncertainty of those two existing regimes. But either way, there's generally uh, a prevalence in that context of uh, the federal over the provincial. And so it's interesting that we've seen recently a number of avenues toward pri uh, uh, privileging provincial jurisdiction um, in, in, in recent um, case law. Uh, some of it's been uh, more heavily studied than others, uh, but uh, one subtle one was in the Malmo Levine case, which is uh, the, the case um, on the criminalization of marijuana for recreational purposes, not for medical purposes. Um, but in that case, the Supreme Court um, began to craft a more stringent test for connecting a law to its criminal law purpose, to its criminal purpose. 
Um, in particular, it held that the prohibition of marijuana for health purposes requires what it called a reasoned apprehension of harm, um, rather than a remote theoretical possibility of harm. Um, and uh, it did, in the end, uphold the prohibition on recreational use of marijuana, because there was at least some evidence that uh, pot was harmful to chronic users, according to the court. Had there been no harm, however, um, even if there was a perception of harm on the part of the federal uh, uh, government, um, uh, it may well have been overruled. And it planted the seeds for a more restrictive definition than we had actually seen in a long time for uh, uh, the um, uh, uh, federal criminal law power. Of course, there it was all made on the basis of the health effects of the arguments were made on the basis of the health effects of marijuana. It's more difficult uh, when it comes to laws directed at morality to demand a connection between a law and its criminal purpose, um, and that's because of different views of the role that morality plays um, uh, uh, and how to come up with evidence that a particular law is indeed directed at morality. Um, and so, um, in the uh, um, Reference uh, Re-Assisted Human Reproduction Act, uh, which I'll call the ARHA reference, um, the Supreme Court was divided 4-4-1 on whether provisions of that act were valid criminal law, in part because the judges differed on the test for when the, the limits of criminal law jurisdiction based on morality. Um, so Chief Justice McLaughlin uh, who with three others would have upheld the act in its entirety, stated, Parliament need only have a reasonable basis to expect that its legislation, quite broadly conceived, will address a moral concern of fundamental importance. And in her view, uh, assisted reproduction was indeed a moral concern of fundamental importance. Um, and uh, um, uh, all you need is consensus in society that the regulated activity engages a moral concern of fundamental importance, which in her view, assisted reproduction did. Um, she didn't have the majority, though. She only had four. Uh, Justices Lebel and Deschamps, joined by two others, um, by contrast, uh, said, no, no, this formulation doesn't do enough to delimit a substantive boundary for the criminal law, and we need a substantive criminal law boundary for the criminal law. Otherwise, they said, and this is the first time I had seen it expressed so explicitly, otherwise, it will threaten federal provincial division of powers by the virtually limitless capacity of the criminal law. Um, uh, and they said, look, some of the um, Assisted Human Reproduction Act was directed at moral wrongs, um, like those directed at commercialization of reproductive materials, um, that is, uh, trade in um, sperm and egg, uh, which uh, the, they accepted was uh, directed at a moral wrong, even though, of course, some people would not perceive it that way, but it was, uh, could be reasonably perceived that way. Um, prohibitions on cloning, of course, moral wrongs, they didn't dwell too long on that. But others um, were really, they said, about the regulation of assisted reproduction as a health service, um, not really directed at moral wrongs, but really the ordinary business of medical practice. And those provisions included things like um, requirements that genetic materials should be stored in licensed facilities, which is, of course, already a requirement for any kind of medical research. Um, or interestingly, they even considered informed consent and age requirements not to be directed at morality, but to be directed at the ordinary um, uh, uh, subjects of, um, of health. Um, this marks a very radical departure, actually. Um, and it's interesting because, of course, uh, you know, anyone who studies health law knows that you know, moral issues come up in health law all the time. Um, and delineating which moral issues are criminal law moral issues and which moral issues are ordinary health law moral issues is not um, obvious. Um, now, many have expressed concern that uh, Justices Lebel and Deschamps um, uh, uh, offer a test that's unworkable, precisely because of what I, just, what I just came to explain. All medical activity can be beneficial in some way, risky in other ways. Um, uh, further, the requirement that criminal law address only harmful um, activities is at odds with really quite a, a vast body of case law permitting regulation of things like food and drugs through the criminal law power, um, uh, 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 which inevitably, of course, balances harms and risks against benefits, but isn't necessarily directed to moral wrong. Of course, I would have argued that um, uh, 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 moral wrongs and harms might 
arguably be distinguished here, right? That you might have one test, the Malmo-Levine test, um, for uh, 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 things that can present harms, and um, uh, another test, arguably, for things that are moral wrongs. But it doesn't really answer the question, because there is a fundamental difference between, you know, if in Malmo-Levine the court would have been prepared to say, if, you know, marijuana is not harmful, it's not really up to the federal government. Well, then, you know, if you know, tin tomatoes aren't really harmful. Maybe those aren't really up to uh, 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 the federal government either, and that runs contrary to quite a, a, a quite a line of case law. Um, but nonetheless, I think what they're evincing is a concern that uh, uh, um, the by identifying some moral issues, some particular um, moral issues, not ethical issues in the ordinary business of health health ethics, but um, but uh, uh, moral issues in relation to assisted reproduction, like the commercialization of reproductive material, uh, the federal government essentially kind of occupied the whole field. That's really what the concern was there. Um, and this concern could be addressed, if not through a narrowing of the criminal law power, um, at least then through other doctrinal tools, which is exactly what you saw in Justice Cromwell's uh, concurring opinion, um, in which he agreed um, in relation to in relation to at least the licensing um, uh, requirements, for example, uh, that that is that uh, that that um, uh, 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 research be conducted, research and clinical work be conducted in licensed facilities, he said, well, that is really a health matter and not a criminal law matter. But he didn't do it by narrowing the criminal law power. He did it through. Um, uh, I think what represents a, a novel form of analysis under the um, aspect uh, analysis in, in uh, constitutional law. Um, so in other words, uh, um, uh, uh, he was less basing his view on restrictive views of the criminal law power itself and more on the perception that licensing and personnel in fertility clinics um, was really more about uh, clinical practice than it was about criminal law, and so it's more of a weighing. It's, it's a more flexible kind of a assist, kind of a, an approach to this issue. Um, this was nonetheless uh, surprising as well, um, and what it appears to be is arguably a kind of revival of the color, colorability doctrine, which some of you might have remembered from the early days, which um, uh, uh, has uh, not has you know, in, in many ways been frowned upon or uh, um, uh, 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 to suggest that one order, one level of government may not uh, do, um, may not infringe on another's by framing their law as uh, within their jurisdiction when really it's directed at the power of the other jurisdiction. Um, and this was most famously used, I think, in the Morgenthaler case, which I'm going to come back to in a minute. Um, the 1993 Morgenthaler decision which prevented provinces from establishing morality-driven criteria for um, uh, restricting abortion access, right? So in that case, it was the provincial uh, uh, law that was considered, and it was considered a colorable attempt to use criminal law. In other words, it was framed as health regulation, but it was really about morals. And of course, that's a, an example that, that is um, very evocative. Um, and it's interesting to see this on the other foot, basically saying, uh, no federal government, um, uh, um, uh, you know, in, in, in the provincial case, in the Morgenthaler case, uh, the court said this is not a space for you to stealthily engage in moralizing legislation under the guise of health. Um, uh, uh, we think you're trying to curtail this important health treatment under a dubious guise of moralization. Well, here it's sort of the shoes on the other foot, right? What the what the uh, court is saying is. Um, you are, through your power to moralize, basically taking over something that actually doesn't have a real moral aspect to it. Um, that's the ordinary business of health law. Um, at the same time, so, so this is one sort of set of trends. Uh, it's, hard to call it, it's hard to call it a trend because it's really based on you know, one, one or two cases, but it's an, at least a, 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 sh a, a possible entry into um, restricting the expansiveness of the criminal law power. Um, and its capacity to reach um, endlessly into health law. Um, at the same time, there are trends in the opposite direction, right? Um, so in both Carter and PHS, litigants trying to protect the provincial health-based approach um, from federal criminal law tried to revive the doctrine of interjurisdictional inter immunity. Um, 
In both cases, that is to say that the provincial law was immune from interference with, um, by the federal law. Um, in both cases, the claim failed, um, with the Supreme Court saying essentially that the federal criminal law power overlapped so significantly with health and acceptably in, overlapped so significantly that it would be daunting to try to draw a bright line around um, uh, provincial health um, where federal legislation may not tread. And so the, that line of cases really uh, reaffirmed the party line up to this point, um, which is uh, health is an area of concurrent jurisdiction and it falls to federal and provincial entities to coordinate um, around their interests without judicial interference. So you kind of see the tension between both approaches, but still the Assisted Human Reproduction Act and arguably um, the uh, uh, um, Malmo Levine case uh, present a compelling kind of counterpoint. Um, and this brings us to the central question of our presentation, uh, which is um, what is the normative vision reflected in this uh, uh, recent effort to try to delineate distinctions between the federal criminal and provincial health power. In other words, um, what uh, normative idea is at play here? So um, in general, authors, some of whom are in this room, um, criticizing the prevailing approach to the adjudication of division of powers have long called for a more normative approach. Um, one that relies less on considerations of flexibility and efficiency, which is, are the kinds of things that uh, uh, are usually invoked to justify just leaving it to politics, right? Um, is, this is all too much, and in our complex world, you know, this is something that courts just simply can't handle. Um, and some have urged, no, we need to move back to some kind of values-based conception, um, and here I'm thinking, um, in addition to people in the room, um, of authors like the dean of this institution um, that I'm in now, uh, Hester Lassard, uh, Bruce Ryder, among others. Um, so the question is, what kind of normativity? Um, now, a number of authors have said, well, we need to look at what the federal arrangement is designed to do, and that's the sort of normativity that we should consider. Um, so a number of the above mentioned authors, for example, have urged uh, 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 a greater integration of the principle of subsidiarity into federalism doctrine. Um, and subsidiarity is the proposition um, that lawmaking and implementation are often best achieved at the level of government that is not only effective but closest to the citizens and, then, uh, and thus more responsive to their needs to local distinctiveness to population diversity. Um, and here I'm quoting from uh, Justice uh, Le Redubé in the Spray Tech case, um, in which she permitted municipalities to impose stricter environmental controls than those required by federal or municipal law. Um, now, in the Assisted uh, Human Reproduction Act reference, uh, Justice McLaughlin, Chief Justice McLaughlin, firmly rejects the idea that the criminal law um, has to be circumscribed to make space for health care. Uh, but Justices Lebel and Deschamps arguably accept this principle of subsidiarity, um, uh, uh, not just in how the law is applied, which some people argued it should be restricted to, but also in the power to legislate um, prohibitions itself. Um, and so their definition of the criminal law power is an important check on this possibly unlimited head of jurisdiction. Um, uh, and so this case has led a number of colleagues uh, 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 in my cohort, particularly I'm thinking of Dwight Newman and Hoi Kong, to see that case as adding a principle where it has been lacking to division of powers, and that principle is a principle that comes from uh, the purposes of federalism itself. But I would add that this offers only a part of the story. In um, emerging with more stringent uh, descriptions of the criminal law power, um, which come both, again, from Mamma Levine and also from uh, 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 arguments made in the PHS case and finally from the Assisted Human Reproduction Act reference, um, this reflects a normativity that's not just about local autonomy um, uh, or freedom from domination, but is actually specific to the criminal law power itself. Um, and here I use as an entry point um, Hester Lassard's work on the PHS case. She argued essentially that jurisdictional doctrine should have taken into account, um, this is in the, in the safe injection site case, the democratic pedigree of the safe injection site, right? The fact that it was generated through the close collaboration of grassroots groups, 
um, uh, with local health authorities and provincial health authorities and indeed federal health authorities um, while the federal authorities were open to such a thing. Um, uh, and she says that this ought to have applied in the consideration of whether to apply the doctrine of interjurisdictional immunity to protect the provincial health initiative. Um, she noted that this could be a problem for feminists. Why? Um, she said, well, does that mean that something like local opposition to abortion would, uh, for example, which is not uncommon, um, uh, uh, would justify restrictions enacted at the local level? And she says, no, because on her theory, um, the democratic pedigree need not necessarily, she's, when she talks about the democratic pedigree, she's talking about the democratic pedigree, including the um, engagement with marginalized groups. Right? And so uh, local abortion restrictions would tend not to engage the groups most affected. And for that reason, she says, she would not urge the principle of subsidiarity to apply in that case because she's talking about subsidiarity, but subsidiarity sort of enriched by um, uh, 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 the participation of marginalized groups. Um, but if we come back to assisted reproduction for a moment, it is, of course, very hard to argue that pe people facing infertility tend to be especially marginalized. Um, if anything, it would be the opposite. Um, and, of course, in the context of physician-assisted dying, it cuts both ways. Uh, and so I think it's crucial to the story of limitation on the criminal law power um, to instead focus on the ways in which the criminal law power is designed to uh, set morals and protect against particular types of danger, right? And that is dangers to which we can attribute individual moral responsibility or culpability. Um, so uh, here what I argue is that jurisdictional doctrine appears to be shoring up a boundary between health and criminal law um, when uh, the criminal law, uh, de depending on whether the criminal law or the health law offers the more compelling account of what the law is actually doing, right? Um, so to put it simply, the criminal law is there to moralize and protect against morally blameworthy harms, and this is consistent with uh, uh, the Morgenthaler 1993 decision, which found uh, provincial abortion restrictions unconstitutional because what they were really doing was disguised moralizing, right? In the Assisted Human Reproduction Act, by, co by contrast, the opening language of Lebel and Deschamps' reasons betray what's really going on here, right? Um, they say, and they open with these words, in 2001, Health Canada estimated that every 100th baby in the, industrialized, in the industrialized world was being conceived through the application of some kind of assisted human reproduction technology. The popularity of assisted human reproduction was bound to increase as it corresponded to need. The same department reported in 2009 that one in eight Canadian couples experienced problems related to infertility. What they are saying is that the use of human um, uh, reproductive technology has been normalized, right? What was once conceived as something uh, morally worrisome is now, in their view, um, moralized. And so uh, what they're doing is they are attending to societal conceptions of the phenomenon and saying, no, um, these are not inherently uh, uh, harmful or inherently mor or morally problematic um, issues um, beyond any other kind of medical procedure, right? Of course, every medical procedure carries uh, uh, some ethical and moral elements to it, but this one, they say, is not morally fraught in any way that is beyond um, uh, uh, any other normal kind of medical procedure, except in the case of commercialization of uh, reproductive material, um, or in the case of um, uh, uh, well, roughly in the case of in the case of commercialization or um, cloning, for example, right? Those are the things that are not ordinary, right? But all of the other aspects of assisted human reproduction, they say, is ordinary. So to conclude, what I would argue is that a more stringent or norms-based conception of the criminal law power um, has the capacity to give expression to local democratic principle, sure. Uh, but it also has the capacity um, to insist that the criminal law stick to its purposes of moralizing and protecting against moral, morally blameworthy harms, as I've said. Um, and such an approach would not foreclose cooperative federalism. Indeed, it won't do away with the overlap. But what it does do 
is demand a clearer articulation of the reasons behind legislation um, and perhaps set up a basis for a more reasoned form of collaboration or a more uh, thought out way of distributing which elements uh, one uh, uh, order of government should have uh, as uh, sort of primary control over. Um, uh, and, and finally, a couple of other side benefits is that this can offer a way out of some of the practical difficulties of amending the criminal law to bring it in line with changing conceptions of whether something ought to be treated as a health matter or a criminal law matter, right? So I, I, I argue those will change um, as we move along, uh, but that uh, a number of criminal law scholars have examined that the chances of getting something taken out of the criminal code voluntarily by legislatures is relatively slim. Um, in fact, our criminal code is full of provisions that uh, are not applied or are applied uh, uh, seldom. Um, and so this offers a way to, uh, interestingly, to bring the, uh, uh, arguably to bring the criminal code through constitutional means in line with popular perceptions. Now, I have a number of caveats and worries about this, as you can imagine. Um, not only, of course, about the uh, uh, capacity of the courts to uh, uh, gauge what is indeed um, uh, the sort of popular conception of an issue as uh, one that's worthy of moral sanction or not worthy of moral sanction. Um, and I, I, I agree that that's an issue. So it's less necessarily an advocacy of this approach as much as it is an observation that, um, that this is what it represents. Um, uh, second of all, of course, I always worry um, that the health frame itself um, uh, 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 um, can uh, be, will then arguably be used uh, in order to swallow all social problems where one desires to keep the federal uh, criminal law out um, within the medical frame. And this brings us to all the sort of Foucauldian criticisms of medicalization and the need to medicalize social problems in order to be able to assert some form of resistance against encroaching uh, criminalization. So, uh, but I figure the caveats are always the sorts of things that are most uh, interesting in the Q&A, so I will leave it to the Q&A.